You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners, the natural world, and the world past. Today, we're talking to Gavin Whitehead, the host of the podcast The Art of Crime, which is a podcast about the intersection of, well, art and crime. The show's second season is all about assassins with an artistic streak, and one of the assassins featured is John Wilkes Booth. Booth, of course, is best known for assassinating President Abraham Lincoln in 1865, but he was also a theater actor. Here's an excerpt from the Art of Crimes episode on John Wilkes Booth, which will be followed by a conversation between me and Gavin. It was 1864, and New York actor Edwin Booth was planning a family reunion worthy of Shakespeare. That year marked the 300th anniversary of the immortal bard's birth, and in honor of the occasion, Edwin mounted a special production of Julius Caesar to run for one night only at Broadway's Winter Garden Theater. Something of a rarity in Shakespeare's corpus, Julius Caesar features three male leads. Caesar isn't one of them, oddly enough. Edwin's bright idea was to cast himself and two of his brothers, both noted actors, in these roles. Edwin would play Brutus, the historical tragedy's most compelling character, conflicted as he is about his role in the plot to assassinate Caesar. His older brother Junius, nicknamed June, would take the part of Cassius, another conspirator. That left the role of Mark Antony, a friend to the slain statesman and an enemy of his killers. Antony would go to the youngest of the stars, John Wilkes. What a cast, enthused a critic for the New York leader. The three best tragedians in the land and brothers at that. It would be the first time that Junius, Edwin, and John Wilkes Booth shared the same stage in a professional production. It would also be the last. New Yorkers bought tickets as if they knew such an event would never happen again. Twice postponed, the performance finally took place on November 25th, 1864. Doors opened at 7.15 p.m., and by the time the curtain rose at 8 o'clock, more than 2,000 spectators had crammed into the auditorium. There wasn't an empty seat, even with five rows added to the orchestra section on the main floor. More than 50 years later, Asia Booth Clark recalled the crush in a biography of her brother, John Wilkes Booth. Quote, The theater was crowded to suffocation, people standing in every available place, unquote. Ticket scalpers left the Winter Garden with a windfall. Last-minute seats sold for as much as $20, $384 in today's currency. The production got off to a scintillating start. In Act 1, the Brothers Booth made a dramatic joint entrance, side by side, wrapped in togas and wearing sandals. The action ground to a standstill as the audience showered them in a torrent of applause. During the ovation, the trio bowed to their mother, Mary Ann, radiant with pride and seated in a box overlooking the stage. Then, during the second act, the performance screeched to a halt for more alarming reasons. The actor playing Caesar was midway through a line when the sound of a commotion cut him off. Above the disturbance, somebody shouted the word that could fill a playhouse with terror like no other could in the 19th century. Fire! Fire! It's not just that theaters were tinderboxes at the time. In an age before venues had adopted modern fire safety precautions, including wider aisles to allow for speedy egress, theatergoers often died just trying to escape, trampled beneath the feet of other terrified patrons. The panic itself could prove just as deadly as the blaze. So when this playgoer yelled fire, a horrible realization would have shot through the crowd. Packed to the rafters, the winter garden was a death trap. The great audience rose to its feet as one man, one performer remembered, and confusion seized the auditorium. Dashing on stage from the wings, Edwin urged calm, as did an off-duty policeman who happened to be present as a paying customer, to no avail. Hundreds of spectators stampeded toward the exit, knocking down others, as screams punctuated the tumult. Firefighters burst into the winter garden vestibule, hoses in hand and bellowing orders. The scent of smoke wafted into the room. Finally, a scenic artist helped calm the mob. Acting fast, he grabbed a great brush and painted a message in enormous capital letters on the backdrop. There is no fire. It has already been extinguished. It was true. As more and more spectators caught sight of the advisory, they relaxed. Meanwhile, police inspectors and firefighters restored order by degrees. After 30 minutes, the excitement had passed and audience members returned to their seats. The actors picked up right where they left off and finished out the play. 
When it came time for curtain call, Junius, Edwin, and John Wilkes returned to the stage again and again as spectators waved handkerchiefs in the air and cheered their names. For all intents and purposes, the mortal terror of an hour or two earlier had faded away. The three Booth boys had every reason to celebrate, yet the night of November 25th would leave a sour aftertaste. The next morning, newspapers revealed what had caused the pandemonium. Three and a half years earlier, in 1861, civil war had divided the nation in two, pitting the Union in the North against the Confederacy in the South. While the Booth brothers were on stage acting Julius Caesar, a Confederate agent set fire to the Lafarge House, a hotel adjacent to the Winter Garden Theater. This arson was part of a larger conspiracy to burn down a dozen of New York's ritziest hotels, a bid to give Northerners a taste of the fear that Southerners were experiencing as Union forces captured their cities. The arsonist, John T. Ashbrook, lit a fire in a third-story room directly above the Winter Garden entrance before fleeing the scene. He botched the job. Hotel employees extinguished the blaze without great difficulty. Ashbrook's accomplices were equally ineffectual. Like the nation as a whole, the Booths were bitterly divided over the war, and an argument broke out as the brothers discussed the plot. While June and Edwin decried it, John defended it as a valid retaliation against what he saw as Union atrocities. He clearly considered violence a just means of avenging the South. In five months' time, he would act on this belief when he entered Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. It's impossible to look at the stage career of John Wilkes Booth in isolation from the crime that made him infamous. Take the Booth reunion at the Winter Garden Theater. John Wilkes biographer Terry Alford calls this production, quote, the most celebrated theatrical event of the assassin's generation, unquote. Astounding, isn't it, that this high watermark in Booth's career, not to mention the American theater in the mid-1800s, involved a production of Julius Caesar, the most famous play ever written about an historical assassination. And isn't it ironic that John Wilkes Booth played the law-abiding Mark Antony while his two brothers portrayed the assassins? It's also impossible to look at the stage career of John Wilkes Booth in isolation from his family. There's a reason three booths in one play could sell more than 2,000 tickets. Not only were they capable actors in their own right, but they were the sons of Junius Brutus Booth, the single greatest Shakespearean on the American stage at one point in time. He may have passed his talents onto his heirs, but with that inheritance came enormous expectations. Striving to meet these would cause plenty of pain in John's professional life. This episode is the first of a two-part series on John Wilkes Booth. As we trace the assassin's path to that fateful day in 1865, we'll examine his stage career and his fraught relationship to the name of Booth. Today, we'll hear the story of how John rose to fame as his father's son, fell into despair with the eruption of war, and hatched a plan to aid the Confederacy by treasonous means. This is The Art of Crime, and I'm your host, Gavin Whitehead. Welcome to Episode 8 of Assassins, A Family Affair, John Wilkes Booth, Part 1. John Wilkes Booth had a vexed relationship with his father and his enduring legacy. If you want to tell the story of this assassin artist, you have to start with this fact. Born on May 1st, 1796, Junius Brutus Booth was endowed with more talents than he knew what to do with. When it came to the arts, he excelled in painting, poetry, sculpture, and acting. With such an embarrassment of gifts, Junius could have gone into any number of careers, making it difficult to find the right fit. At the age of 17, however, he devoted himself to the stage. Within two or three years, he had proven himself one of London's most electrifying Shakespeareans. The first role to win him serious recognition was Richard III, one of Shakespeare's most venerated inventions, right up there with Hamlet, Macbeth, and Othello. Among the most hated English kings, this fork-tongued tyrant is deliciously nasty as portrayed by Shakespeare. He orders beheadings as he would a cup of mead. Not long after his wondrous rise, Junius left London never to return. In 1820, his eye fell on a beautiful, dark-haired flower girl named Mary Ann Holmes, who plied her trade outside Covent Garden Theater. 
They courted on the sly, married in January 1821, and then vanished without warning, destined for a new beginning in the United States. Within a few years of their arrival, Junius purchased 150 acres of land in Maryland, three miles away from the nearest village, Bel Air, 23 miles away from Baltimore. The couple made their home in a four-room log cabin. The property featured a garden, orchard, and fish pond, while rolling hills and dense woodland surrounded the household. It was here that Junius and Marianne would bring 10 children into the world, five of whom survived into adulthood. Junius took pride in his farm, but he might have liked to enjoy it more than he could. Shortly after immigrating, he cemented his status as an entertainment phenomenon. He toured relentlessly, appearing in theaters across the country. Over the course of his career in the U.S., Junius gave an estimated 2,800 performances in 68 cities. He had a reputation for never turning down an engagement, no matter how podunk the town. His fame spread far and wide as a result. According to drama critic William Winter, quote, he was followed as a marvel. Mention of his name stirred an enthusiasm no other could awaken, unquote. As is sometimes the case with artists of Junius's caliber, genius went hand in glove with eccentricity. He was notorious for erratic behavior on stage and off, earning him the sobriquet of the mad tragedian. He often played Hamlet, and during one performance, Junius stopped talking to the actress playing Ophelia in the middle of a scene, scrambled up a ladder against the back wall, and started crowing like a rooster. It was only with great effort that his manager coaxed him back down. Now and then, Junius skipped scheduled performances altogether. On at least one occasion, the absentee tragedian's collaborators went looking for him after he failed to materialize for a show, only to discover him wandering the woods in costume, refusing to explain what the hell he was doing. Yet there was a darker, more destructive side to his unpredictability. Junius hit the bottle, and when he did, he hit hard. Worse still, he was quick to throw punches when inebriated or even just angry. While playing in Charleston, South Carolina in 1838, he flew into a rage and attacked his manager with a fireplace and iron, a metal stand used to hold logs. The victim fought back and broke the assailant's nose, marring his face and nasalizing his previously melodious speaking voice. Junius harmed himself as well. One day, Mary Ann walked in on him trying to hang himself, a noose around his neck and his feet in the air. She cut him down in the nick of time. My God, my God, what could have come over me? He exclaimed later. Junius also had a skeleton in his closet and its uncovering disgraced the family. On November 16, 1846, a woman named Marie Christine Adelaide Delanoy disembarked from the Great Western, a steamship that had just pulled into New York. Tall and refined, she liked to introduce herself as Mrs. Junius Brutus Booth, not without good reason. Belgian by birth, Adelaide met the actor when he was boarding at her mother's residence in Brussels. They fell in love and moved to London, where they married in 1815, some five years before Junius met Mary Ann. He told Mary Ann that he had married once before, but he led her to believe that he had divorced his first wife. In fact, he never had. When Junius eloped to the other side of the Atlantic with Mary Ann, he abandoned not only Adelaide, but his young son, Richard. For a time, Adelaide may do with a yearly stipend faithfully paid by her runaway husband. But then she caught wind of just how wealthy Junius had become as an actor abroad. Hungry for a larger helping of his income and aflame with freshly reignited rage over his infidelity, she went after him with a vengeance. My lawyer will fall on his back like a bomb, she wrote to her sister. Having hunted the deserter down to Maryland, Adelaide ambushed him and made it known around town that she was his lawfully wedded wife. Exposed as an adulterer, Junius had little choice but to meet her demands. First, he paid $1,000 in compensation. Then, he contested nothing when she filed for divorce in 1851. His transatlantic spouse's resurfacing caused a scandal, and Junius lashed out at Marianne. According to John Wilkes Booth's biographer, Michael W. Kaufman, townspeople overheard him berating her while intoxicated. The debacle gave way to Junius's unexpected death. While on tour in 1852, one year after the divorce went through, he came down with a severe cold and died alone in his cabin aboard the U.S. Chenoweth, a steamboat bound for Cincinnati. His body lay in state for three days at the Booth residence, now on Baltimore's Exeter Street. 
A sealed glass panel afforded Grievers one final look at the luminary's face, his gray eyes half open, his lips curled gently into the ghost of a smile, his brown hair streaked with hoary white. A bust of Shakespeare positioned nearby seemed almost to gaze downward into the casket, as if to bid adieu to one of his most indelible interpreters, Junius the Mad Genius. John Wilkes Booth came into the world on May 10th, 1838, following his father's footsteps from an early age. He and Edwin, his older brother, even helped the troupe of juvenile dramatics, joined by other neighborhood boys. Blessed with a knack for comic timing, Edwin took the funny parts and strummed his banjo during musical numbers. The performance venue shifted from production to production, with the Booth brothers playing in boarding houses as well as stables. The boy impresarios borrowed costumes, props, and even horses for the occasional equestrian scene from local families. With production values like these, they felt justified in charging admission. Children gained entry for just one penny, while adults paid twice that. The booths were well on their way to show business. John may have adored his father's vocation, but he had mixed feelings about his father. On a professional level, John respected Junius for his skyscraping skill and the glory he had brought to the family name. At the same time, he resented Junius for the shadow he would always cast over him as a performer. His would be a career of inescapable comparisons, of constant measuring against the mad tragedian. Next to that giant, John could easily look like a shrimp. Added to these frustrations were personal grievances. Junius's alcoholic escapades embarrassed John, and his abuse of Marianne after Adelaide's revelations infuriated him. He had always cleaved closer to his mother than his father. As an adolescent, John became obsessed with defining his identity in relation to his family as well as his father. He even tattooed JWB on the back of his left hand in permanent India ink, his initials encircled by a wreath of stars. In the words of Terry Alford, quote, the initials affirmed his identity as a booth, but they also asserted his individuality. He was himself and not his father. Junius was a great actor, the greatest, but John could be a better man, unquote. In the summer of 1857, aged 19, John embarked on his stage career, determined to succeed. He had a lot going for him. His mind was sharp and his memory retentive, both of which would come in useful. He was also well-favored in the looks department. There's no getting around it. By 19th century standards, Booth was hot. I mean, really hot. Men and women agreed on this point. Lean, brawny, well-proportioned, five foot eight and hazel-eyed, he wore his curly, long black hair in what playwright Augustus Thomas referred to as Civil War Standard, parted on one side. Theater critics likened him to Roman gods and gushed about his, quote, manly beauty, unquote, in review after review, fanning themselves with one hand as they scribbled down their effusions with the other. But could the heartthrob actually act? The answer is yes, yet it would take time for Booth to find his footing in front of the footlights. The first three years of his professional life saw him gain confidence as a performer, and as he gained confidence, he also leaned into his identity as a... Stay tuned now for our conversation with Gavin Whitehead, the host of The Art of Crime. So hi, Gavin. It's great to talk to you today. So to start things off, I'll ask, how do you think Booth compares to other assassins that you've covered on your show? How is he similar or different? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Second of all, to answer your question, I would say John Wilkes Booth probably has the biggest name of all the assassins that I cover this season. And that really sets him apart from some of the other figures. I, I definitely cover figures who went after targets with big names. So for example, I talk about the playwright and radical feminist Valerie Solanus who attempted to assassinate Andy Warhol in 1968. Um, and the season starts with an episode about uh, the Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros. He's like one of the big three uh, muralists from Mexico in the 20th century, but he also attempted to assassinate Leon Trotsky who is maybe more familiar to the general public than C.K. Yudos himself. Hmm. Um, so apart from just having like a big name and a lot of infamy, I would say that John Wilkes Booth 
stands apart from other assassins that I cover, partly because there's something almost artistic to the way that he carried out his assassination. Mm -hmm. So, of course, as you mentioned, uh, John Wilkes Booth was a stage performer and he was probably on his way to becoming like one of the great actors of the 19th century in the United States before he left the stage and started planning a conspiracy uh, first to kidnap Abraham Lincoln and then to assassinate him. But what's important is that John Wilkes Booth was a man of the theater, right? Um, so it's impossible to look at how he carried out this assassination without bearing that in mind. So as listeners probably know, John Wilkes Booth targeted Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., while he was in the middle of watching a play called Our American Cousin. And I talk a, quite a bit about the creation of that play on the podcast. But it's not only that he attacked Abraham Lincoln in a theater in the middle of a play, but after he shot Lincoln, he basically stood... It, this was up in the presidential box, so it was over the stage from on the right-hand side of the theater from the audience's perspective. So he stood up on the balustrade, uh, he would have been visible to a lot of the spectators there and then cried out six Semper Tyrannis, which is supposedly what Brutus uh, declared after assassinating Caesar. And then after that, he leapt down onto the stage. It's probably like 11, 12 foot, an 11 or 12 foot drop. And incidentally, John Wilkes Booth was famous for sort of executing similar stunts uh, during his stage career. Hmm, but what's important? Yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that he was known for. He was also celebrated as like one of the great theatrical swordsmen of his generation. So hmm. he was good at kind of action scenes and battle scenes. But anyway, you know, I started by saying that there was something almost artistic or theatrical to this assassination. What John Wilkes Booth has done is not only carry out this heinous crime, but he's recited a line from memory in Latin to a to a you know a, a a playhouse full of spectators. And then he's basically executed a daring stunt, the kind he was known for pulling while he was an actor, before making his getaway. So there's something inherently theatrical about this assassination carried out by a man of the theater. And I think John Wilkes Booth is kind of a special case in that regard. Um, because there's no one, there are other, like Valerie Solanas, for example, was also an aspiring playwright. And people have sort of interpreted her attack on Andy Warhol in theatrical terms, but it's just nowhere near as pronounced as in the case of John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was one interesting thing about your episode was you talked about, I mean, you sort of covered just now how theatrical it was, the assassination, which definitely stands out as being very dramatic. But you also mentioned that the other thing you can't really separate is booth's family mm -hmm. and i wonder if you could talk a bit more about that like how how they influence that dynamic influence the assassination sure yeah i think you're absolutely right to to pull on that so i i when i started researching the story of john wilkes booth and the assassination of abraham lincoln i quickly decided that i wanted to present the narrative as something of a family drama so actually in a past life i was a theater historian hmm. and um i specialized in 19th century british theater so I was like aware of what was going on in the United States, but it wasn't my area of expertise. And of course, I knew that John Wilkes Booth was an actor. And I also knew that his brother, Edwin Booth, was an actor. And in fact, was one of like the most significant actors of the 19th century, uh, full stop, in the United States. But what I did not realize <clears throat> fully is that John Wilkes Booth's father, Junius Brutus Booth, how's that for a name, <laughs> was like the most famous Shakespearean on stage at one point in time in American history. And that was just so fascinating to me. And it just means that from an early age, John Wilkes Booth knew that he wanted to go into acting, but he also knew that he was coming from like the most important theatrical dynasty in the country. And he would have to live up to expectations that his father had created before him, right? So he has that hanging over him throughout his entire career, especially in the beginning when he was afraid that he wouldn't quite make it. He actually got off to a really rocky start and like embarrassed himself on stage on multiple occasions. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm trying to talk about here. I, I talk about how the name of Booth changes over the course of the 1860s, really. So... Abraham Lincoln is assassinated in 1865 on in April 14th. And there's a part in the second episode in the Booth series where I basically say, you know, up until today, the name of Booth had belonged to the single most significant theatrical dynasty in the country. And then 
bang, overnight, it belongs to the most infamous criminal in the country. And that carries absolutely devastating personal and professional consequences for John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edwin, Mm -hmm. um, who uh, temporarily retires from the stage because he's just too ashamed even to look at an audience, right? I mean, he feels somehow implicated in the assassination just because, you know, he is the brother of, of Abraham Lincoln's killer. And, you know, spoiler alert, Edwin Booth would sort of recover. He would come back to the stage and he would go on um, to achieve great fame. But his association with the assassin of Abraham Lincoln stayed with him for the rest of his career. And it in, 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 um, inevitably, inevitably sort of colored the way that audiences saw him on stage, particularly when he appeared in plays that touch on the theme of assassination. As mm-hmm. he did yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of another interesting angle. You know, so there's this whole theatrical dynasty element to it. But, you know, there was uh, Edwin Booth's politics differed radically from those of his brother. And uh, in many ways, you know, the country, the United States was divided over the Civil War at the time, and the Booth family was as well. So that's that's another kind of component to the family drama that I go into in the episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There's a lot of dynamics going on there, and it seems it seems like Booth just kind of wanted to be the most famous of the Booths, maybe by any means possible. That's definitely part of it. I mean, yeah. this is a guy who like lived the cliche of the vainglorious actor. I mean, he used to literally say to his acquaintances, "I must have fame." He would just lay it all out there. Yeah, and you know, a few days or a week or a couple of weeks before he committed his crime, he told a friend that he would soon. It's something I'm it's something to the effect of I'm going to do a deed that will make me remembered for all time. So mm-hmm. I think there is definitely a hunger for notoriety involved in committing the crime. One thing I found that I didn't know very much about in your episode was his perspective on John Brown, who was the mastermind behind the raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, um, who was seen in the North as a martyr in the South as a maniac. And you included some, I think it was like a letter Booth wrote to his sister. He, he calls John Brown the grandest character of the century. Yeah. And I thought that word choice character was really oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about how John Brown might have influenced Booth as he was like moving toward the assassination. Yeah, right. I'm sure you're drawn to that word because it's how we talk about characters and plays, right? And it's coming yes. from John Wilkes mm-hmm. an actor. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing that he was so um, enthusiastic about in the case of John Brown was that he was larger than life. I mean, he was as large as life as characters who appear in plays are that, and you know, he was a man of action and he acted on his convictions. Now, John Wilkes Booth was unabashedly pro slavery. He hated everything that John Brown stood for in that regard. And Brown was executed. Booth actually was present at that execution and Mm -hmm. proudly claimed later on in life that he had helped to hang John Brown. So he hated Brown's politics, but what he admired about Brown was this heroic stature that he possessed and his readiness to commit acts of violence in the name of abolition, which, you know, was, was a calling of his and Booth, Booth did not support that, that cause, but he, he identified with that readiness to commit violence. And of course, that's what Booth would go on to do five or six years after the hanging of John Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. that's really interesting. It's definitely, it's something that I was really surprised by when I did my research. And that's part of why I wanted to include it in the episode. Yeah, I was surprised too. I'd I'd known that Booth was like there when John Brown was hanged, but I didn't know about his sort of, what he thought about that. And I was, yeah, because John Brown was such a huge deal, obviously, um, to Americans. And I could see Booth being like, I'm going to be like just as big or bigger somewhere, maybe in his mind. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I guess as you, you mentioned at the at the top that you, Booth is probably one of the more well-known figures, perhaps, that you covered um, in the season. Mm-hmm. And you've mentioned a couple of times things that maybe surprised you. But was there anything, like the biggest thing that surprised you about Booth or about this story as you did your research? <laughs> The biggest thing that surprised me. Well, I will tell you that I, of course, had known about the conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, But I did not know that that conspiracy had started as a plot to kidnap Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Um, And 
that sort of unfolded over the course of several months between the end of 1864 and the beginning of 1865. And it ultimately fizzled out. And things got pretty tense because Booth had recruited several conspirators who were getting frustrated with their leader because he seemed not to be doing anything. It was just, he kept talking about kidnapping Abraham Lincoln, but the plans never went anywhere. The other thing that I would say that surprised me, which is related to this story, and this is actually going to happen in a forthcoming episode, but there's a bonus episode at, at the end of this season about the actor manager, Laura Keene. So I mentioned the play, Our American Cousin, a few minutes ago. That was the play that Abraham Lincoln was watching at the time of his assassination. So Laura Keene bought exclusive rights to that play. She was born in England, had come over to the United States and had become this huge sensation in New York. And she was an actor manager, which means that she starred in the plays. But beyond that, she called all the shots. And she was just kind of a genius. Like she supervised costume design, lighting, sets, refurbishment of the theaters, advertising, like you name it, everything. She had to sign off on it. And she was backstage at the time of the assassination and John Wilkes Booth like shoved her out of his way as he was escaping from the theater. And she has an amazing story. There's an amazing story to be told about what she did in the wake of the assassination to try and preserve order in the playhouse because it descended into out and out chaos. Um, but she, you know, she, she did what she could uh, to keep the peace. And then eventually she made it up to the presidential box where Abraham Lincoln lay shot and dying. And I found this moment just so moving actually you know, she's up there and there are, I believe, three doctors on the scene. And one of them's just like, I mean, this he's been shot in the head. He's hes not going to survive. It's impossible. And Laura Keene is there at this moment. And Laura Keene, you know, she was extremely adept at managing crises backstage. It's part of why she had achieved such success as an actor manager. She was not the kind of person that would just do nothing, even though there was no way they could resuscitate Abraham Lincoln. So what she does is she kneels beside him, cradles his head in her lap, and she has fetched water, and she puts a handkerchief in the water and just starts rubbing his temples, mm. just trying to comfort this dying president as much as she possibly can, because that's what she can do in this moment. And indeed, uh, her dress got stained with his blood, and scraps of the dress are now in the collections of various museums in the mm. United States. Yeah, I mean, it just such, I don't know, that, that scene in the, in the presidential box is so, is, it's, really, it, it, it's really moving to me. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that scene made a, a big impression. I and mean, I'd never yeah. heard of Laura Keene before. I think I've heard about the dress before, but I didn't know, hadn't heard her name or her story. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of assassinations, I mean, this one, there's so many characters involved. There, there was the people yeah. in the box and all the conspirators and a lot here for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and you mentioned the, the plot before the assassination, the kidnapping plot, which like in terms of a dramatic plot is even, it's like, doesn't even make much sense. And I don't even know what, I, even those conspirators were like, what? Like that doesn't, yeah. You're going right. to do what with him? Okay. Right. Um, right. As originally they wanted to kidnap him as he was riding through the countryside on horseback, which makes a certain amount of sense if you're trying yeah. to kidnap someone. But eventually, Booth changes the plan. is like, let's go after him while he's in Ford's theater. And his conspirators are like, that's never going to work. I mean, mm -hmm. there are like a thousand people in there. And a lot of soldiers went to watch plays at Ford's theater because it was in Washington. Like, you really think like hundreds of soldiers are just going to sit and let us carry off the president of the United States. No, that'll never work. It's a suicide mm -hmm. mission. So yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, just to wind things, wind things up, um, I'll just kind of return to your second season about assassins. I mean, how many assassins have you featured this season? That's a good question. There are, I think, nine episodes, but two, but I think seven. Okay. Yeah. Do you have like a favorite among those? Ooh, a favorite assassin? Like a favorite yes. episode or a favorite <laughs> Well, um, um <laughs> I mean, I mean, Valerie Solanus is my favorite okay. episode of the season. Okay. She is just 
such a character. I mean, so she's best known for, well, first of all, she's best known as the author of Scum Manifesto, um, which the scum of Scum Manifesto stands for the Society for Cutting Up Men. Uh-huh. And in it, in the manifesto, she calls for the complete eradication of the male sex. This is this is s- sentence number one. <laughs> she's like, she's like, all right, here's what we need to do to like solve all the social ills. And she also says that we have to introduce automation so that nobody has to work anymore. But also in the same sentence, it's like, oh, and we need to destroy all men. So anyway, she's like a real character. But, you know, she's like this really sharp writer. And the manifesto is part like satire. It's not meant to be taken entirely seriously. But, you know, there's some really astute analysis of like gender conventions. And that's part of why it's remained like a famous text and it's still taught you know, college courses today. But, you know, (laughs) she went after Andy Warhol because of a play that she wrote, which was titled Up Your Ass. (laughs) So she's part of this this crazy, like, New York countercultural scene of the mid to late 60s. And, you know, listeners can go and check out the episode if they want to hear more. But you should get a sense already that, like, Valerie Solanas was just as she was a larger than life character and she hung out with a lot of larger than life characters too. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It does sound like a fascinating one. Do you, you don't have to answer this if you don't know or don't want to, but do you know what your third season is going to be or do you have plans? I do. In fact, I've started writing it. So the, the third season is all about Madame Tussaud. Oh, Madame Tussaud and the Chamber of Horrors. So for those who may not know, the Chamber of Horrors is an exhibit inside the Wax Museum, and it features like wax statues of notorious murderers. Mm. So basically, what people don't know, I mean, everyone sort of knows, like everyone knows the name Madame Tussaud, but I think people aren't as familiar with her biography. At the time of her death in 1850, she was like the most famous show woman in Britain. I mean, she was an institution. It, it's no accident that her wax museum like grew into the empire that we uh, know today. Um, so, and she also bore witness to the French Revolution and saw the what uh, saw the bloodshed. Anyway, there, it's it's quite the story. So, the season is going to be eight or nine episodes, and. Uh, it tells the story of Madame Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary Paris and ending in Victorian London. And basically, each episode advances the story of her life and her career, but each episode is also structured around one memorable exhibit within the Chamber of Horrors and its various iterations. So there's also a story about a criminal in in virtually every episode. Wow, well, that sounds really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm stoked. I'm. Like I said, I was a theater historian um, in a okay. past life and I had studied Victorian drama. So I, I've, I've done some work on Madame Tussaud and that's sort of how I came to this idea. All right. Awesome. Well, um, thanks for talking today about John Wilkes Booth and everyone check out your show, The Art of Crime. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and make sure to keep up with new episodes by subscribing and following us on TikTok at Real History Uncovered. Discover more of the fascinating stories from the worlds of history and true crime at allisinteresting.com. And to get the most out of All That's Interesting, you can join our newsletter by going to allisinteresting.com slash signup or becoming a member at allisinteresting.com slash membership. If you have a question about the show, a story you'd like us to cover, or just want to say hi, call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. History Uncovered is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring. <laughs>